Our first mysterious place lies in Italy. It looks spooky. Things that were left behind, covered in dust, in the middle of deserted houses. As you can clearly see from up above, it's a ghost town. We learn the ghost town is called Apice. Today, you can still watch tragic incidents like the one that happened in Apice on TV. A heavy earthquake was the reason why the inhabitants left 36 years ago. Allegedly, there are still people around in this deserted town, which is in danger of collapsing. We head towards Italy. The ghost town is supposed to be about 100 kilometers from Naples. All of a sudden, a roadblock. Behind it, you can already see the mysterious town. But we are not allowed to carry on by car. From the internet, we know it's not illegal to enter the town, but it is dangerous because many houses are close to collapsing. And that's why they have all these roadblocks. Even from the outside, there are things to discover. The former inhabitants have even left very personal belongings behind. even cars, there is nothing comparable in Europe. Noises coming out of a building. Who else is here apart from us? We go to check it out and can hardly believe our own eyes. Unbelievable, a barber shop in a seemingly deserted town. There are actually people here, so the rumors were correct. Io sono uno degli ultimi artigiani rimasti qua e sono molto legato a questo centro storico perché mi ha dato la vita a me e la mia famiglia. Pertanto, anche se sono rimasto da solo qui, mi piace tanto, tanto lavorare, finché il Padre Eterno mi dà la salute di lavorare ancora. Io resterò sempre qui. The hairdresser Tommaso is the only one who comes to Apice every day. Even though he doesn't live there anymore, he continues to cut and shave his customers from the neighboring villages just like he did for the last 60 years. Because his barbershop is situated on the fringes of the town and is not in danger of collapsing, it is officially tolerated. But the earthquake dating back 36 years has changed Tommaso's life forever. In the area around Naples, earthquakes are a common occurrence. But the one in 1980 was especially bad. He remembers it very well. Era di domenica e dovevamo vedere la partita. C'era una partita che era molto importante, Juventus Inter. Allora stavamo tutti presi per Tutti in un momento, caro mio, è stato qualcosa di incredibile perché non eravamo abituati a vedere una cosa così enorme, così, sai, paurosa, un rumore enorme, veramente, polverone da tutte le parti. This is what it sounded like. This original soundbite was recorded by accident during a concert. Luckily, there were no casualties in Apache, but Almost all buildings were close to collapsing after the earthquake, even if they were still standing. Many were uninhabitable. Reconstruction would have cost a fortune. Most inhabitants fled in panic after the quake. They left many things behind. Others weren't so easily chased away, like the hairdresser Tommaso. 
but since the state didn't pay for the reconstruction, everyone left after a short while. The lively Apiche turned into a ghost town. The state of Italy built a new modern Apiche for the victims of the earthquake. It was a lot cheaper than rebuilding the old town. Purtroppo si hanno perso i valori, i valori familiari, i lavori uniti che ti sentivi da una porta all'altra, ti chiamavi con gli amici, sai, erano tutti pronti a favoriti come tu allora, entrambi, stavamo tutti uniti. Là è dispersivo. Purtroppo lo devo dire, anche se è una realtà, è dispersiva. Allora ci comprendiamo poco, abbiamo perso tutti i valori del nostro paese. Spero che non finisca così. Vi presento il mio grande amico, il professore Frusciante Antonio, che lui vi accompagnerà per tutto il paese perché conosce quasi meglio e più di me. Insomma, io farò il possibile, parecchio. <ride> dire tutto è esagerato. <ride> Above all, Antonio knows where it's safe. He knows the town inside out. This is where he came out of the church at his wedding. Right here, once was a village fair. Antonio shows us the street where he was born. The earthquake has completely destroyed it. We have rebuilt the street according to his description. Molto strana perché, insomma, la vegetazione si sta, come si vede, si sta riappropriando del, degli spazi. E, niente, poi da bambino eh, giocavo, ci riunivamo, eh, quindi il luogo, luogo di incontro era la, la nostra piazza. Perdi quello che è stato tuo eh, luogo eh, dove hai svolto parte della vita. Antonio shows us the old house he used to live in as an adult. E qua le distanze erano così brevi, vivevamo uno addosso all'altro, al punto tale che a volte si chiedeva pure all'altro così vicino di, di accendersi la sigaretta perché aveva smarrito l'accendino, così per esempio. Però lui dall'altro lato. People lived in extended families. Until today, the inhabitants mourn over the old Apiche and dream of rebuilding it. È anche possibile, eh, perché quando perdi un qualcosa, eh, è chiaro che poi eh, nel ricordo c'è l'enfasi. È contemplato l'enfasi. Ma tutto quanto io sto dicendo, diciamo il 90% eh, è, è, è reale, per cui uh, diciamo che quello uh, di una volta è, è un paradiso perduto. But not all is lost yet. This old palazzo is one of the most intact buildings. It's actually quite safe to enter. This used to be the old office of the local notary. The files are just lying around and they are in extraordinarily good shape. After all, they have been rotting here for 36 years. The apartment next door belongs to a hardware dealer, Apache's richest inhabitant. It looks absolutely intact to us. Downstairs, a bar. The wine bottles are full. Maybe someone was just about to open them when the earthquake started. Why everything is still here, Antonio is unable to say. The cars are a different story. Antonio reveals to us that the owners wanted to save the scrap charges and therefore just left the cars here. A policeman shows up. Will we get into trouble for entering the houses? Legal no man's land. But after a short conversation, local police chief Lovson Porcelli doesn't want to chase us away, but actually wants to help. 
he organizes a ladder. The chief of police wants to show us the old church and the old cinema. Both are in this same building. He used to work in the cinema. All of the entrances are bricked up, and this is the only way to get in. Oi, guarda un po', guarda un po', Luisa, guarda che cosa si sono sconsiderati questi signori. Questo filo di corrente non appartiene all'impianto elettrico, bensì si sono sconsiderati di legarla alla due serie per poter agevolmente scendere poi una volta salite qua sopra. But the chair helps us to enter the building as well. We have obviously entered the priest's bathroom. The church of Apice, especially interesting for thieves. Almost everything was stolen, apart from a few statues and the confessional box. It was obviously too heavy to carry away. Thanks to a wedding photograph from Antonio, we know what the inside of the church looked like. But there are also horrible memories. Antonio tells us that 500 years ago, 50 people fell through the floor and died during an earthquake. Later on, the cellar also served as a tomb. We discover a human skull and bones. This is where generations of former inhabitants lie. A spooky place. Let's go to the cinema instead. It was run by the church. That's why it's right next door. Films were displayed every weekend. After the earthquake, people celebrated mass there for a while. That's why there is a provisional altar. The reason? The floor of the actual church was threatening to collapse and couldn't carry the weight of many people anymore. Chief of Police Porcelli shows us the tiny projection room where he used to work as a film projectionist. This is where he kissed the woman he would later marry. But apart from that, people were rather prudish. Perché essendo un cinema gestito dalla dalla chiesa, qualche scena un po' più scabrosa, casomai la gamba un po' scoperta doveva essere tagliata e per cui si doveva ricongiungere, insomma, in modo sincronico il il film, insomma, la pellicola. But even still, the chief of police describes his former home using the exact same words as everybody else. Sì, assolutamente sì, è un paradiso per tutto. Maybe there is a ray of hope for the lost paradise. The mayor shows up unexpectedly. She wants to give an interview. Certo, noi veramente puntiamo molto sul recupero e sul riattivare il centro storico. Eh, noi abbiamo già recuperato il castello, quindi noi siamo sicuri che partirà. Of course we don't know whether these are false promises, but we wish the former inhabitants that their ghost town will soon be a lively place once more. From Italy we travel to our next mysterious place, which lies in Malaysia. Here, in the jungle of Borneo, lies a hidden place with a culinary secret. A secret for which the workers risk their lives. Is he still alive? No, no, he totally died. In these caves, swallow nests are collected. This yield is a million dollar industry in Asia. In Cambodia, there are huge breeding shelters where the swallows build their nests. Female workers refine the nests in so-called cleaning shops in Thailand. From there, they go to China. 
The Chinese swear by the health-promoting effects the swallow nests have, and sometimes a portion can cost up to 120 euros. It's a true delicacy. The secret of this delicacy begins on Borneo, in the Malaysian part of Borneo to be precise. The Gomantong Caves are situated here in the midst of the jungle. Many swallows build their nests in the caves of this region. On top of the mountain are a few huts. From here, the swallow's nest collectors climb down into the cave. The whole thing seems a bit improvised, but for them it's everyday life. <laughs> Sharif Hashim is the eldest worker. He is especially nervous when his colleagues descend. The difficult part in going down. Going down. Why? It's because sometimes the ladder is broken and then you will be, we will be old. Sharif has already lost eight colleagues. Jahar Mastan was accident pulled down from the top. What happened to him? It's because of he is already careless. He didn't die his tibet. Is he still alive? No, no, it's where he died at that time. Incredible. The only safety device is this, a thin rope. Our cameraman is not allowed to descend. For that reason, the collectors wear helmet cameras. The descent into the caves alone takes almost 30 minutes. There are metal ladders hanging down 80 meters above the ground of the cave. The bird's nest collectors use them as platforms. They are very skillful. That's important because if a nest falls to the ground, they lose 40 euros. Roland is the boss of the bird's nest hunters. He takes us to the lower entrance of the cave. Roland hired a security team to ensure that the valuable bird's nests are not stolen. The team guards the cave for 10 days before the next team takes over. Four times a year, the men can harvest for eight days. During this time, the workers sit on ladders at the roof of the cave. The climbers are the ones who earn most in the cave. They receive a sort of hazard pay. They get 1,700 euros for these eight days, an amount many people in Borneo don't even make in an entire year. But danger is always lurking around the corner. Made from bamboo. It's a light material like this, and then spin it like that, so the person bird nest will fall down to the basket. The workers are very skillful with the self-made giant scraper. Nest after nest ends up in their baskets. The workers spend the whole day on the ladders. To climb up for a break would be too much of a hassle. But it's not the only way to harvest nests from caves. We travel to Cambodia. A breeder has agreed to show us how they produce in vast quantities. The safeguarded concrete bunker is a swallow nest farm. Here too, safety comes first. Sona Un is the owner and the builder of the farm. You just want to observe our bird. That's why we installed a video camera inside. We call it bird house and we build this house because uh, because we want to get their nest. If you want to see, we can, uh, we can uh, take you to go inside. Sona Un has just recently put the swallow nest farm into operation. The entrance door is solid. Nobody should be able to enter easily. 
there's also a water barrier which prevents insects from entering. It's incredibly loud inside the house, but there are no birds here. The house is empty. The noisy singing comes from loudspeakers. We are playing the sound of the bird because we, we make them feel like uh, in the house has, has some birds stay already. Uh. This is uh, this is the bird bird shit. We put bird shit here because we want them uh, to smell. We want them to believe that have some birds stay in this house already. That's why they have uh, their shit in in this house. The birds are supposed to find ideal conditions to build their nests. Important, not just little corners, because this is the corner of uh, nesting plan. If we put the corner, the nest will be bigger. The building and operating of birdhouses like these has become a mega business in Cambodia. Along the coast, whole bird villages have developed. Swallows prefer to breed in colonies. The more birds there are in a house, the more birds will be attracted. In this business, we don't give food to the bird. They find and then they eat by their own way. Okay. It's not like chicken or cow or duck. Several thousand birds with their mates are supposed to have space in Sonal Un's new house. He leads us to the second floor. So uh, we had to quickly do the record. Okay. As you can turn, turn off the light first. Mr. Sonal is very worried about the well-being of his birds. Uh, in this house, I thought around 3,000 birds. I cannot count it. But maybe we can estimate it maybe uh, 3,000. On this floor alone, he harvests around 6,000 nests. This is uh, the new nest. You see it? The small one. Uh -huh. We just start to make the nest. The squares in the corners force the birds to build larger nests. The swallows make their nests from their saliva. After the breeding season, they leave them behind. For one nest, it's uh, around $8 to $10 for one nest. That way, he makes almost 44,000 euros a year in a country where the average income lies at under 110 euros a month. To transport the nests to his customers in China, Son Aun needs a middleman. People in China like to eat the bird nest. And when they eat the bird nest, it's young chest and the skin is very uh, beautiful. <laughs> The dealer doesn't just send the nest to China, there's still some refining to do. Cleanliness has top priority here. First, the workers wash the nests. The bird feathers must under no circumstances end up in the soup. Afterwards, each single nest is washed by hand. There is a whole cleaning division at work. Even the tiniest feather particle is sorted out. Because only a perfect product is able to realize a decent price in China. After the cleaning, a worker brings the nests back into shape. The dissolved nests are turned into so-called cookies. The cookies are once more checked and dried afterwards. After a few days, they are ready for delivery. The speciality is sold in supermarkets.
The swallow nests from the breeding bunkers cost three euros per gram in the shop. The nests from the Malaysian cave are more than double the price. But the harvesting is a lot more dangerous over there. It takes several men to move the ladders up and down in the cave. There are many teams gathered together at the same time. To prevent arguments, the government has set strict rules. For 100,000 euros a year, you can buy a harvesting license for a particular spot. Without it, you are not allowed to sell the nests afterwards. Each year, the cave yields about 400 kilos of bird's nests. The natural cave produces the best nests. But there are differences according to size and quality. One has to be precise about it. That's why the boss himself takes care of the valuable yield. First grade, second grade, third grade and fourth grade. Okay. The most valuable nests are black. They are built by a very rare swallow species. The secret of the cave workers on Borneo. At the same time, a secret of the Chinese cuisine. From Malaysia, we travel on to Milan. We are at a prison in Milan. The Bolate looks quite ordinary. Fences, high walls, cameras. We have to pass the Sally Port. The gate in front of us only opens once the gate behind us has closed. Afterwards, the grill clunks shut. And from now on, this prison is anything but ordinary. This is the front desk. We feel as if we're at the reception desk of a hotel. A senior prison officer hands us the visitors' passes. They do have a sense of humor, as these posters and the smoking prohibited sign with the tank busters show. Colored walls, mural paintings, and colored grills catch our eye, all of which are designed by the prisoners. The intention behind it, whoever is kept busy and feels at least somehow at home in this environment, stays peaceful. Whether this idea actually works is something these two prisoners can tell us. The 60-fold bank robber Stefano Beni. Yes, you heard correctly. He robbed about 60 banks or post offices. He has spent 27 years behind bars. La parola libertà secondo me è una parola infinita. Solo come tante cose le apprezzi sempre più quando ti vengono a mancare. Our second interview partner is Franco Agnifili. He was sentenced because of international drug trafficking. He was also a member of the Italian Mafia. That's why his sentence was so severe. He still has 10 years to go. Niente, sto pagando la mia condanna. In cui sono arrivato in questo carcere, fortunatamente. Per questo carcere è un mondo aperto, ti dà mille possibilità. About 1,100 men are serving their sentences here. Amongst them, felons, sexual offenders, and even serial killers. Bolate is not for model prisoners. The program is for everybody. The prisoners are not constricted to their cells. They are allowed to move around freely in designated areas during the day. The only rule, they have to always carry these papers with them. That gives us a queasy feeling. This is our first impression of the worldwide unique occupational and reintegration program. The theatre group is rehearsing a new piece. It's about hostile gangs and about violence, a great problem in every prison worldwide. Many of these men are imprisoned for life. Some will never leave. Frustration and aggression are inevitable. But thanks to the openness and the many possibilities, violence is not a problem in Bolate.
The prison warden tells us the second reason for this concept. Avendo provato, e posso dire che l'ho provato anch'io personalmente in altre esperienze, che il detenuto che è chiuso tutto il giorno, che non fa niente, esce più incattivito di prima e ricommette quasi sempre nuovi reati. The statistics back him up. The relapse rate for normal Italian prisoners is at about 60%. In Volate, it's not even 18%, and that saves money. Because every single detainee costs the taxpayer about 45,000 euros. In spite of the openness, there are definite rules, of course. For safety reasons, visitors are not allowed to enter the cells. We are the first camera team to be allowed to film. We meet the former drug dealer Franco while he's cleaning up his cell and we are surprised how homely it looks. Single cells such as this one, we hear, are only given to prisoners on good behavior. But all prisoners are allowed to design their cells in whatever way they want, even paint them, paying with self-earned money. C'è il tuo colore giallo che mi dà la sensazione di aperto, di luce, un po' di libertà anche. Qua ho il mio computer che lo possiamo acquistare sempre noi e non c'è internet, il televisore, il frigo che è sempre acquistato da noi, da noi detenuti. Qua ho il mio mobile, ci sono le pentole, i piatti che... E questo è il bagno, è un bagnetto diciamo in ceramica rispetto in altri carceri in ferro <ride> ed è una cosa buona e niente, nient'altro. Qua finisce la cella. Photos of children everywhere. Franco has a son and a daughter. E sono riuscito a, ad andare in un altro paese, diciamo. Sono stato per 12 anni e in questi 12 anni ho avuto eh, il mio primo figlio, diciamo, in Spagna, che è nato in Spagna. E, e niente, io a quest'ora, se mi avrebbero preso, Nel 94 avrei già finito la mia condanna, però nello stesso tempo non avrei i miei figli. Perciò se li metterei sulla bilancia non saprei da che parte, da che parte pende. The first thing bank robber Stefano does is offer us a self-made espresso. Then he introduces his fellow prisoner to us, a black bird called Gino. He rescued it in the yard when one of its legs was injured. He built this birdhouse especially for Gino, but the bird isn't locked up inside the cage. Ma perché sono già in gabbia io, sono già in carcere io e non mi va di tenere anche un animale in gabbia. Se si è domesticato lo tengo, altrimenti lo lascio andare, perché non ha senso. Small pets are allowed in Volate. This is something very unique. It results in a verifiable decrease of aggression and violence behind bars. Start-up time for the prisoners. Nursery, workshops, kitchens. Everyone is busy here. There's even a sound studio. The idea behind it, whoever is busy, doesn't get into mischief. We accompany former drug dealer Franco to his workplace. Which is a call center of an Italian electricity and gas supplier right in the middle of a prison. We can hardly believe it. This too is unique in the world. Twelve prisoners work here with a regular contract for 800 euros a month. External co-workers check and help as needed. The prisoners receive about 25,000 calls a month. It's mostly about bills or reminders. The callers from outside have no idea they're talking to a prisoner. È importantissimo, penso. Primo perché hai un'autonomia, diciamo, economica, non c'è bisogno magari di andare a disturbare la famiglia e nello stesso tempo puoi anche mandare dei soldini a casa, che non sta male. 
the only measure of security, the phones can only be called from outside. It's impossible to place a call. And the computers, like in any prison, deny internet access to prevent crimes from being planned or even executed. Apart from that, no special supervision for the bad boys. They need less security personnel in Bolate and therefore save money. Theoretically, every prison could be organized like that, as our guide, senior prison officer Vito Francini, explains. Noi non facciamo nient'altro di quello che è scritto nell'ordinamento penitenziario, trattamento e rieducazione. Ovviamente siamo stati i primi a farlo e adesso ovviamente man mano tanti altri istituti vanno sulla stessa lunghezza d'onda, però noi non facciamo niente di diverso da quello che è scritto nella legge, no? nell'ordinamento. During his workout at lunch break, former drug dealer Franco explains to us why it's working out so well. No, è proprio così. Qua diciamo che ti senti un attimo più libero e lo apprezzi questo anche perché non ti viene voglia, non ti passa dalla mente di trasgredire. Almeno per me. We meet bank robber Stefano at his job in the horse stables. This is not a classy riding stable. The horses are not ridden. Many are old, sick or were mistreated by their former owners and confiscated by the state. The detainees built the stables by themselves from recycled material. Like, for example, this volleyball net. These prisoners here are training to be grooms for the time after prison, including everything there is to learn. Grooming, mucking out, cleaning of hooves. They even practice how to saddle horses, even if they never get to ride them. I think it is very important because you can get it, it can be helpful at a level of economic support, not depend on your family, and then you can also an experience for your future. I think that in the carceral structure, I think that it is the most important thing for a detainee. The instructor, Claudio Villa, also gives courses in which prisoners can learn more about how to handle horses in general. Here he demonstrates what to do to make the horse calm down. A simple occupational therapy. The prisoners are kept busy and their day is structured. The main goal here in Bolate. Il cavallo non ci giudica come facciamo noi tra umani. Per cui lo stare con il cavallo ci dà l'opportunità di liberarci dei filtri, dei paletti che noi umani abbiamo. Per cui con loro manifestiamo quello che siamo. End of work after seven hours, but the day is far from over yet. Animal lover Stefano tends to the birds and the rabbit on his floor. If he finds it, that is. The animals belong to all of the prisoners in this cell block, not just to a single one. Oh, what's that, Paul? Our queasy feeling has vanished. Even the senior prison officers seem very relaxed. No, assolutamente, anche perché poi qui viviamo una realtà diversa dagli altri. È tutto molto sicuro, sia noi che i civili. Ci sentiamo più sicuri all'interno che non all'esterno. We meet Franco again in this storage room. If the prisoners aren't happy with the food, they're allowed to order in their meals. Franco is just picking up his weekly order. He's able to cook for himself in his cell. The costs are deducted from his wages. The normal prison food is free of charge. Today, it's pasta, fish and vegetables. Doesn't actually look too bad. The prisoners eat in their cells. These huge refectories only exist in American prisons and movies. Discreto. Diciamo che uno che non ha possibilità di farsi la spesa può, può benissimo mangiarlo, insomma. Magari lo riciclano un po', certe, certe pietanze li si riciclano, però tutto sommato è mangiabile. A rispetto di certi istituti che proprio mangiare non è inguardabile. 
Then everything calms down. Time to think things over. Stefano often thinks of his two grown-up sons. Diciamo che ho fatto più carcere che libertà, nel senso che ho trascorso 27 anni nelle patrie galere. Oggi 54 anni ho tirato un po' la somma. Purtroppo più vado avanti adesso con l'età, più mi accorgo di quello che ho perso. Gli effetti familiari, la libertà in sé, che non ha un prezzo secondo, secondo me. Ex drug dealer Franco wants to show us a video of the christening of his seven-year-old daughter. He wasn't allowed to go on a supervised trip, something that's only rarely permitted. Looking at the images, Franco is unable to hide his emotions. Mi sarebbe piaciuto esserci. Soon the cells will be locked up for 12 hours overnight. Not everything is different to ordinary prisons. But on the whole, we have the feeling the concept in this prison actually works. From Milan, we go on to Alaska. Alaska, endless wilderness, virgin nature, high mountains. The 49th federal state is the largest, iciest and emptiest state of the USA. And it's here we find a truly mysterious place. This tower consists of houses built on top of each other. It goes up 50 meters into the sky. An extraordinary sight. That's why our reporter Nora takes a closer look. Wow. The tower is notorious. The architect is said to have died many years ago. He allegedly built the tower to have the perfect view of Alaska's highest mountain. The media calls the tower Dr. Zeus House, named after the author of How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Just rumors, because we actually found him. The builder of the tower. After long investigations, we came across the name Philip Weidner. How are you? Fine, how are you? So you must be Philip. I am. I'm Nora. Pleasure to meet Hi. you. <laughs> nice gloves. <laughs> yeah. You got a beaver. <laughs> okay, so you are alive. I <laughs> am alive, yeah. Well, this morning I woke up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice I'm still to breathing. <laughs> Philip Weidner has been living in Alaska for 30 years. He is a lawyer, but also a civil engineer. And he built this house. So what is the idea behind this tower? Why did you build this? Because I could, <laughs> and I wanted to. <laughs> so, but the first idea was to build a house, just yeah, a normal just house? Just a log, a log house, yeah. yeah. Philip doesn't need a permit for the building. By the way, he simply calls his masterpiece Tower. I think you heard of the name Dr. Seuss House. Right. What's the story behind this name? I don't like that. <laughs> Why? What? Well, people call it that, but I... It's and you're not, not the Grinch? No, I'm not the Grinch. <laughs> well, maybe some people might think I am, but uh, no. We are allowed to enter the tower. It's not very safe, though. That's why the climber Brett comes along. Philip only accompanies us halfway up. From then on, you have to climb up ladders, which he is unable to. Okay. Wow. At first sight, we realize this is not just randomly hammered together. The original blockhouse is solid, a whole 150 square meters large. Many locals helped Philip to build this. Each additional house was a new challenge. 
With every additional floor, the weight, which the underlying houses have to carry, increased. So we stuck on top of this house. Uh, it weighed um, 14,000 pounds. And we picked it up with a crane at midnight. It was 30 below zero. And, and we dropped that 14,000 pounds of platform on top of those eight pillars. Yeah. They, had, they had iron caps. We, we figured it all out and we just dropped it in. Philip and his friends worked on the tower for three summers and a winter. There's still a lot to do. But this is all going to be glass. And this is going to be glass, kind of like a greenhouse. What, do you want to continue to build this? Am, am I going to? Yeah. Oh, of course, yeah. And when? Well, when I get some more money. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so was it expensive to build this whole thing? Yeah, yeah. How much the costs were exactly, Philip doesn't remember. He wants to build a large bathroom and a bedroom in the upper floor of the original house. Eight massive wooden pillars carry the main load. The tower has shrunk 30 centimetres due to the continuously heavier weight. In order to prevent further shrinking, Philip has to add pillars. Can we put a jack in there? That's, another, that's one of our... So otherwise it would come down? Well, it's just that helps, that helps carry everything. Okay. The pressure point. A total of 25 tons of steel were used to support the beams. It doesn't inspire much confidence, but it seems to work. The tower has even endured a 7.2 earthquake. Even if the legend that Philip built the tower for its view is not correct, the higher we get, the more breathtaking the view from the window is. And originally, I was just going to do this. Yeah. One house on top of a house. And then we got this one up and we started looking at it and we thought, well, we can put another one. And then we started looking at it and thought, well, we can put another one. So you're kind of addicted yeah. in building houses. Well, just, yeah, I guess it just was fun. Philip owns a total of five houses, which he designed himself. The tower definitely is the most unusual and largest of all. Of course, he doesn't need all of the space just for himself. I've got a family and everybody, and we're all going to share it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can come around. Sure. You're welcome. When there's a lift. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome, yeah. <laughs> he wants to share the house with two children and four grandchildren. With that many houses, it's no wonder our reporter loses track. But not just her. Yeah. So this is the third house. Well, let me think. Wow, it's quite deep. I don't see. It's hard to tell. But th but there's there's little side places too. That's why people ask how many stories. I can't tell. I don't know how many stories there are. Halfway up the tower, there are still no stairs, only ladders. Because he injured his leg, the owner can't climb any further. We hand Philip a camera and a walkie-talkie. From now on, Brett, who also helped building, is accompanying us. Philip, can you hear me? Yes, I can. OK, the view is so nice. I like it very much. It just gets better and better, you know, and... Uh... I don't know if you're going to be able to get to the top, but the top is it's, it's pretty stunning. We think so too, so let's go up. But climbing keeps getting more difficult because there's hardly any space left. But that doesn't keep Philip from having big plans for the upper floors too. So the upper floors are just for the view? No, they're also going to be livable too. And, and some of those uh, upper floors, uh, there's going to be places with platforms with beds and things so people can sleep up there. And then uh, okay. most of those upper floors have um, uh, 360-degree decks on them. And then, finally, the last ladder. <sighs> oh. 
almost 50 meters above the ground. The perfect view. Today, we can't go up to the very top floor, the church spire, because it's too icy. At the top, there's another building. What are the plans for this one? Uh, I'm going to put a, um, a plastic bubble. Um, so you can sit up there and look at the northern lights. The plastic bubble is supposed to go up there, where the rod is. Philip wants to install a radio station in the church spire itself. So there are a lot of names. What is this? Uh, we have Joey, girl named Storm. Jesus was apparently here. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, these are all the kids who have gone up here and wanted to show something that they've been here. But they aren't allowed to go yeah, there. No, no one's allowed up here. OK. This is, this is invite only. Of course, everybody wants to come up here. It's a lot of work to do. Yeah. 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 What do you think? How long does it take to finish this house? Well, the, the basic structure is done. Now I just got to get the uh, uh, the decks done and get the windows in. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, you know, if I really got on it, I could do it in a year. But Philip Weidner, a man with dreams. And one thing is certain, by building this house, he himself has become immortal. So, Phil, thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Well, it's really a privilege <laughs> thank you. to meet you. Yeah, and good luck. Oh, yeah. And that was the story behind this mysterious house on top of a house, on top of a house, on top of a house. On top of a house.